Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad you're here. We just have a ton of information to go over. Uh, you know, I, I could really do a show every night uh, with all this information that, that's going on that you really don't get to see or hear about. However, uh, there was one issue that the press was covering, and that was the lawsuit against uh, Secretary of State Mark Ritchie uh, for uh, basically uh, extortion, not extortion, but uh, embezzlement. Spending state money without authorization for his own personal project. Um, and so there's a lawsuit on that. Criminal charges should be filed or some type of sanctions against uh, Mark Ritchie. It is a felony embezzlement. Um, but uh, you heard the news report. You saw snippets. We'll, we'll get you to hear um, most of what Eric Cardle said uh, today and then a question by uh, one of the reporters about the issue of uh, fraud by... Uh, Secretary of State Mark Ritchie. So we'll be doing a little bit of that. We're going to cover Maplewood elections. I'm just going to give all you Maplewood people out there a uh, fair warning. Uh, it's going to be during the first 15, well, by a quarter till. You want to call in, you want to talk about Maplewood elections, uh, you can do that right now, anytime. But once we're 15 minutes into the show, you know, uh, 8.15, we're, we're cutting her off. Uh, we've got too many other things to talk about today. Um, Ray w Woodstrand, he had a, child, a trial uh, today, uh, or not today, yesterday. And also he had brain he had surgery to put his uh, skull cap back into place yesterday. So, uh, Ray didn't have a trial as attackers. Well, his attackers. Uh, some of his attackers had a trial, so that was interesting. And the Pioneer Press, fortunately, is covering that story and very interesting. This is why you just don't make assumptions uh, when you're not there and you hear the rumors and what the press is reporting beforehand because there's a lot more information coming out and, uh, on that. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Planned Parenthood obstructing child rape investigation. Uh, and breaking the law in the process because they are not allowed to do that. But you know, what do they care? They've got so many fines and lawsuits against them and uh, for uh, uh, double billing the state. So uh, it's, it's a troubled organization, uh, in my opinion, a very corrupt organization. But, uh, so, but the main thing we're going to talk about today is the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disability, another hearing in the Senate, which is, this is very serious, it's a treaty with the United Nations that's supposed to benefit disabled people, uh, but it doesn't. And actually it takes away parental, it can and has shown itself to take away parental rights over uh, parents who have children with disabilities. And it's very, very troublesome and we'll get into that a little bit. But let's start out with uh, Maplewood. If I don't get a call on Maplewood, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of information on it. Um, but if I don't get calls, I'm going to start other subje subjects quickly, and then you can come back and call within the next uh, 10 minutes. But otherwise, we're, we're moving on. Uh, you know, here's how I felt about the elections. The people I wanted lost, and, and I think this was a pretty serious loss, uh, it's going to take quite or a bit of organizing to overcome this loss that took place for people that support the Constitution, um, for people that support property rights and personal rights of not getting beat up. But basically the same old, in my opinion, corrupt uh, group of people uh, got back into power and it's just going to be uh, another uh, four years of just bad news after bad news. And it's not, it's not pretty out there at all. So, uh, you know, maybe some of them will have to resign because of the, their behavior. Uh, who, who knows? But I just couldn't help but thinking about the book of lamentation, Lamentations in the Bible where the prophet Jeremiah weeped over Jerusalem uh, for its uh, lost children and for just the the 
sour attitude and the, the, the depression over Jerusalem and the captivity of its people. And um, that's, that's basically where Maplewood is at now. And it's, it's going to be a rough, rough time. But uh, the people I was supportive of, Diana Longry, Margaret Behrens, and Rebecca Cave, uh, really nice people. Um, evidently, Maplewood doesn't want nice people who do right. They want mean people who do wrong, in my opinion. And, uh, well, that's what you got. Uh, good luck for you. Luck to you. Uh, but it should be, you know, let's, let's have a, a Maplewood uh, week of mourning here and then uh, pick up your, pick up your uh, skirts and loin garments and get going. Uh, you got to organize to stop this. Uh, they have no concept of freedom of association. Um, you got, they're a church. That's exactly what Maplewood has turned into as a church, and they're going to be the church leaders. Uh, but instead of you volunteering your money to the city of Maplewood, they're going to take it from you and give it to other people without you receiving any benefit for it. Uh, so that, that's a big problem. Uh, I want to talk uh, some good news about Ray Woodstrand. Uh, he did have surgery uh, Tuesday, Tuesday, yes, no, yesterday. He had surgery Wednesday to put a skull cap back on, part, parts of his skull back on, and the doctor said it went very well. He didn't have um, uh, any bleeding in the process. They didn't have to drain anything. Uh, from a skull which could create more problems if there was bleeding. So that was a very, very positive uh, 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 surgery that went forward. Ray also was in the process of standing on his own. Uh, that happened this last week for the first time. And, uh, you know, working on his balance. Uh, just, just fantastic. Uh, he's, he's got a long, long way to go before he's on his own. and. And, and back to normal, if we'll ever get back to normal. Who knows? But uh, so keep praying for Ray. And also, there was a trial yesterday while he was having his surgery. There was a trial against some of the uh, people who were accused of uh, beating Ray Woodstrand. And there was some video shown. And according to the paper, and the, you know, I, I wish I would have known, I would have made it to the to the, the trial, but somebody was taking a picture of on their cell phone, and it wasn't just one, two girls that were having a fight. It was two sets of girls having separate fights, uh, as I understood it. And I think what's going to happen here, once all the testimony comes out, I hope that John Choi, the Ramsey County prosecutor, brings charges against these girls for you know what, I think they're old enough to be called women. Uh, you know, if they're over 14, they should be called women. They should be adults and behave like adults. We can't make excuses for kids and for adults and call them kids when they're, if they're 14 years old, they're adults. That's a mistake our society is making uh, and we don't hold them responsible to that level. So. These girls need to be charged for starting a, uh, basically a riot or starting an event that caused, triggered events so that Ray Woodstrand uh, was severely beaten. And it's the understanding of the witnesses there that Ray actually was helping one of the gals up when he, he got attacked. And that is, that just sounds right. I mean, Ray would do that. He would help somebody, not hurt them. And in exchange for that, he got beat up uh, and is going through this trial, a personal trial himself and his family of uh, all the time, effort, and money to recover. So keep praying for Ray uh, that it goes well. Also, uh, Planned Parenthood. This has happened in Washington State, actually from, they say, Bellingham, which is in the north uh, west corner of Washington State um, by up towards the upper end of Puget Sound. It's actually in the area where my uh, dad grew up, Linden, Washington. Oh, okay. 
who's living in Everson. That's where my dad grew up. Uh, it occurred in September of 2012 when Luis Gonzalez Jose, an illegal immigrant farm worker living in Everson, that town was named after my uh, uh, dad. It used to, uh, my dad's side of the family uh, used to be Kinley, uh, but they changed it to Everson. Um, and he then raped the 11 year old daughter of the woman he was living with. And the girl became pregnant at 11. These are women, you know. <laughs> uh, and Mr. Gonzalez, Jose, secretly took her to Planned Parenthood, where presumably all child rapists go to clean up their crimes. I, what would you do? You, you rape somebody, you rape a child, a child, you take them to Planned Parenthood if they get pregnant, and then all the evidence is gone. Okay, and this part, Planned Parenthood has done this over and over and over again. Understand, Planned Parenthood is as evil and despicable and corrupt as you can get. There is nothing, nothing more corrupt than Planned Parenthood. And because they, they take life and they crush it and they kill it and they rip it apart piece by piece by piece, limb by limb. Limb, and they'll take the brains of a baby and they'll scramble it while it's in a mother's womb. Or they'll put saline solution in and that baby will burn to death. And, and it's just a, a terrible, terrible thing to do to human life. That's all it is. It's human life. And that same baby that is in that womb is the same baby that comes out of that womb. It's still, it's still them. It's still, if it was you, it'd still be you. It's not something different. And for Planned Parenthood to cover up all these rapists and that do these to these little kids is terrible. And of course, unbelievably, and this is rare, but Planned Parenthood said, hey, yeah, this is happening. Uh, this happened. Okay, and they reported it, but then when the sheriff goes out there to do an investigation on this rape and reported rape, Planned Parenthood won't cooperate. And so Planned Parenthood, uh, and by statute in Washington State, you have to in that type of situation, in a criminal investigation. However, you know, Planned Parenthood's right. We participated and we destroyed evidence in a criminal act. You better get a warrant before we participate. You know, I don't blame them. Uh, sheriff, get the warrant, you know. But the law, you know, and that may be a problem with the law there in Washington State, but get the warrant, do your investigation, find out what's going, what's going on. But terrible thing out there in Washington State. Uh, and that's not that area of town. That area of town is just not that way. You know, my dad grew up there. My family's up there. Decent people. And uh, they don't support that type of activity. However, you know, how the illegal immigrant got up there and uh, did. And this is the other problem. The girl that got raped, uh, as my understanding, was also an illegal immigrant. So what does an illegal immigrant do when their crime is committed against them? This is the vulnerability of an illegal immigrant. They, they have to take it, basically, and, uh, and just let it go. And so human rights violation all over the place uh, because they're afraid to be uh, deported as well they should be afraid to be deported. Okay, next uh, we're going to show some maple wood. We're done. Okay, you don't, uh, we're done with that election. Nobody had any input on that, so it's just surprising. Um, lawsuit against uh, Secretary of State Mark Ritchie. Uh, we're going to watch a video here of uh, Eric Cardle, who's uh, been to the U.S. Supreme Court a number of times, goes into federal court all the time, very, very bright man, 
uh, and actually I go down to uh, the John Adams Society and he's down there and a couple other guys and I tell you it ends up being a comedy club. Uh, they're just so funny. Uh, it's a blast. But let's hear what Eric Cardle has to say about this lawsuit against Secretary of State Mark Ritchie. My name is Eric Cardall, and these are my clients. As we were, uh, we filed or about to file this verified petition for full warrant. Of Why was I hired? I was hired because these uh, people approached me, and I wanted to vet their claim before filing. This is not a claim that's intended to get one headline. This is a, com a, a complaint that's filed in order to accomplish something in court, and that is the court enjoining the Secretary of State from this unlawful action of online voter registration. That's not anti-government. That's redemptive. When you go to court and you file a lawsuit to stop a government official from violating the law, that's redemptive of the system. It's not a waste of taxpayer dollars. It's an effective way for the people to manage their government. The verified petition for full warrant of, some of you have been following uh, the lawsuits that have been filed, is modeled after that which was filed from the end of the fiscal land session cases. Also, uh, if you recall, Treasurer Matson filed the petition for warrant of many years ago when the state legislature encroached on his constitutional prerogatives. And this is a, a venerable writ that we're applying for, and it's very simple. You, complain, you, you combine the complaint with your motion for judgment. And so this is the only document that will be filed, then there will be a response brief, a reply brief, a hearing, and the case will be over. And what I found is that we need to find expedited ways to bring uh, state officials to account for violating the law, and the courts were working with us. And that's how people are managing their government now. When the state officials violate the law with impunity, and here remember Secretary of State Ritchie did it with respect to the constitutional uh, ballot titles, remember that? He, he did the titles, and the Supreme Court found that he was in error. And so now you have one, two, and now a third time, and he, he still acts with impunity with respect to the law. Will Secretary of State Ritchie ever learn that he needs to follow the law, and when the court strikes his actions down as illegal, maybe he should be a bit chastened. But he's not chastened. He doesn't care what you think, or the governor thinks, or what we think. He thinks he can violate the law with impunity. He doesn't care what the law is. And when we elect an official, they must care what the law is. And if they don't, there will be these routine, inexpensive lawsuits filed, and we'll go to the court, and the court will find that he's violated the law and stop him. That's the purpose of this petition. It's not political. It's about managing our government officials so they follow the law that we pass. If the laws of Minnesota aren't sacred enough for our administrators to follow, what is left of democracy? With respect to the, to the standing my clients have, there are two developments because of this abundance of litigation we've had against um, state officials in Minnesota. The first is, again, taxpayer standing. Minnesota is the beneficiary of court decisions that allow for very broad taxpayer standing. So here you have funds that are being distributed by the Secretary of State without authority by law. He is he's mispurposing state funds. That is money that he does not have to spend for this purpose. That's a misappropriation of state funds. As we all know, what the state Minnesota State Constitution says, if you mispurpose state funds, that's embezzlement. It's a felony. And that's a problem. And, and Mr. Uh, Ritchie needs to know that, that if you mispurpose state funds for private political reasons, be it anything, that's a problem for Mr. Ritchie. And the taxpayers have a right to have taxpayer funds spent for lawful purposes. And Minnesota courts have recognized standing. And secondly, and almost more important, and this really gets down to something that's very near and dear to my clients, and that is legislators also should have standing. The Minnesota courts have not yet to this date recognized that individual legislators can bring lawsuits against state officials when usurping legislative power. This is the case where that's going to be decided. These gentlemen here, these representatives, and Mary Franson who couldn't make it today, are representatives who have the right to determine the issue of online registration and voting. An individual legislator should be able to bring a lawsuit in Minnesota courts when a state official is usurping that legislative project. So those are the three aspects of the case that I've been hired for. One, the targeted petition for writ of four warrant, though. Uh, secondly, 
the uh, taxpayer standing issue, and thirdly, the legislator standing issue. And for those reasons, and the others already stated, this is a very important case with statewide implications. All right. Uh, this is huge. <laughs> a lot of things will come out of this uh, lawsuit. And uh, first of all, Eric uh, and his clients, his clients have been using Eric to tons of lawsuits against the executive branch and legislative branch and uh, for things they do that violate the Constitution and the judicial branch. It's amazing that our judicial branch in Minnesota doesn't understand what free speech is. And so they constrict judges and lawyers from telling uh, the truth about what's going on in the courts. You have to go through a series of basically cases and only the, the higher ups can tell their spin on what's going on, nobody else. And it makes for a very, very um, unethical, corrupt judiciary in my opinion. But here's the interesting thing, you know, if the governor, executive branch, violates a legislator's order, if the judiciary violates uh, legislative laws, uh, the legislator should have standing. And yet, that's never been dealt with. And this, since I've started in this whole family law, uh, I, can't, I can't say business, I'm not in the business, but understanding what's going on with family law and then it gets you into the courts and it gets into the legislature and what's going on here and there. So I understand that there are just a whole bunch of gaps in our laws and people want them there and the only reason they want them there is to exploit other people. And this one here where legislators haven't had standing or it hasn't been dealt with, legislators haven't understood the power they have and the responsibility they have to provide checks and balances. Yes, this is a separation of powers issue. The separation of powers says legislature gets to make the laws and they get to appropriate the money. And if they don't appropriate it for a specific issue, the executive, the, the governor and his executive branch can't appropriate it for anything else. Okay, they could choose not to appropriate money that's been appropriated to something. They have that prerogative if they don't have enough money. They should have. Every organization has that. You know, okay, we're going to spend, uh, you know, $10 million, but you only bring in five. Well, what do you do? You can only spend five. That doesn't give you a carte blanche to go out and buy another $5 million or borrow $5 million. So... When the executive branch says, well, we, got, uh, we get to spend $10 million, but no, we're going to spend 11 they don't get to do that. The executive branch doesn't get to do that. And that's where they're talking about embezzlement and running your own thing. So a legislature should have standing to go in there and say, hey, stop it, knock it off. And that's what Cole Warnto says. It's an order, it's an order to stop an action of a branch of government when they violate that. And uh, I just thought it was a very, very good point uh, that uh, Eric brought up um, that Mark Ritchie has done this before. This is not new to him. With the constitutional ballot titles, you know, he got slapped down pretty hard by the Supreme Court except you know, one of the Supreme Court justices who's no longer there, Paul Anderson, really, really, and he, I've seen him say this a number of times in the Supreme Court. Well, you start with the statute, then you go up to the Constitution and interpret the Constitution by the statute, and then you use the Constitution to go back down to the statute and interpret the statute. Uh, I don't know what law school he went to, but I think they ought to be embarrassed. But you start with the Constitution and then go down to the statute. Uh, you know, who doesn't know that? You know, that's the way it's supposed to work. But it really doesn't work that way when uh, you don't want it to. And I, unfortunately, I think that's the way Paul Anderson uh, ruled. And then Mark Ritchie, 
who cares? I'm just going to do what I want to do, and everybody out, you pay the consequences, and, uh, you know, come get me. That's basically what he's saying. Uh, he doesn't care what the law says. That's what Eric Cardle says. He doesn't care. You know, it's not an interpretation problem here. It really hasn't been in all these things. He just, he just doesn't care. You know, that's, that's a problem. Uh, and the other good point, what is left of democracy when this happens? Uh, control room, do we have it all set up for the end of that clip? Okay, let's play the end here and hear the question that's asked by Pat Kessler and then uh, uh, Eric's answer. And, and Eric, you, you um, mentioned, uh, when you're talking about mispurposing state funds, you mentioned two words, embezzlement and felony. Are you suggesting that uh, crimes could have been committed? Uh, well, I'm, yes, but when we have state funds and are used for uh, non-authorized purposes, that means that Secretary of State Ritchie is using this for his personal uh, private purposes. It is not authorized by law. So it's a really serious thing when you use state funds that's not authorized by law. I mean, imagine if a, a Department of Revenue official uh, used uh, funds coming in for his own purpose, maybe a campaign or whatever. And here, Secretary of State Ritchie is receiving state funds and he's using it for an unauthorized purpose. So he's diverting state funds from lawful purposes to unlawful purposes. And uh, there should be accountability in that regard. And, it, and of course, uh, the, the problem that you're having, uh, Mr. Kessler, is that we don't hold people who have big job titles uh, accountable to the law. Only little people, like myself, we get, we get nicked on our license tabs or our driver's license expirations, all these things. But if you're big and important, no, you're not held accountable when you're repurposing funds that should be spent for a lawful purpose to an unlawful purpose. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. We don't hold, we don't hold pe big people accountable, only the little people. Well, uh, Eric Cardle and Minnesota Voters Alliance, uh, Andy Selick, I've been trying to get him on the show. He's supposed to be on tonight. He just, it just, does, it isn't working out <laughs> lately. Um, but uh, also Minnesota Majority with Dan Graff, McGrath, um, our participants in this lawsuit as long as three, as well as three legislators, Steve Dutchkowski, uh, four legislators. Um, no senators uh, on the Republican side on this. I don't. I don't understand that. And why? Why wouldn't? Why isn't there a Democrat um, representative or senator? Because their power is being taken away. They're the ones being abused too by their own Democratic person, Democrat person, uh, Secretary of State. Yeah. Uh, it's it's too bad. Okay, we're gonna. Switch gears now and go to the Convention on the Right with person, uh, Persons with Disability. This is a United Nations treaty that some 136 countries have signed, but the United States hasn't. And there's a particular reason they haven't signed it, is that because it takes away the right of a parent with a disabled child to raise that child and care for that child the way they see fit. And uh, that was the big argument going on before the Senate committee uh, that took place on Tuesday on election day here and what was really interesting about this is that they tried this pass this treaty last year and when they came in and Michael Ferris came into the hearing and testified it was pretty much the Democrats and a couple Republican senators and uh, about three three people that testified against the treaty and three that did, but there was really no Republican in the audience testifying or at the table testifying for the bill except John McCain. Uh, and today, and this time they brought out some of the bigger guns, not necessarily bigger, but more big guns on the Republican side. They brought in Tom Ridge. They also brought in um, former Oh, uh, Attorney General with George Bush, uh, Richard Thornburg. And uh, so they testified in favor of the hearing, trying to give this, oh, the Republicans are for it. Well, the majority of them aren't because they understand the importance of parental rights. And it's the first treaty that takes away 
uh, our right as a people, as Americans, as a state of Minnesota, to determine what our domestic policies will be. No other treaty will let the United Nations come in and determine and affect our laws and how we deal with our relationships internally. None. This one allows it, and that's the argument that's going forth here. So I'm going to have us here. I think the first one out there is uh, Michael Ferris with his opening statement, and then we're going to see some really good uh, debating uh, back and forth going on. So let's hear Michael. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Corker, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, on behalf of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, I'm here in opposition to the treaty. The, there are three reasons I would like to cover in the time that, that I have today. First, despite the claims to the contrary, the U.S. ratification of this treaty does impose binding legal obligations on this country, and it will be the responsibility of the United States to comply with international law. The uh, statements to the contrary have been based primarily on what I would, in the course of litigation, you would call naked assertions. We do not hear citations to legal authority for these propositions. You don't hear appropriate citations to qualified experts, such as Lewis Henkin. Lewis Henkin is one of the leading experts in the world on international law, and he responds to the tenor of the argument that's been raised in support of this treaty. He says, in a, in a different context, but the, the, the principle is applicable, the United States apparently seeks to assure that its adherence to a convention will not change or require change in U.S. laws, policies or practices, even when they fall below international standards. Reservations designed to reject any obligation to rise above existing law and practice are of dubious prior propriety. If states generally entered such reservations, the convention would be futile. Even friends of the United States have objected to its reservations that are incompatible with the object and purpose and are therefore invalid. The United States, it is said, seeks to sit in judgment on others, but will not submit its human rights behavior to international judgment. To many, the attitude reflected in such reservations is offensive. The conventions are only for other states, not for the United States. Professor Henkin has it exactly right. This is a treaty. A treaty is a law. It's if the emotional and political arguments that are in favor of the treaty, no one can disagree with these, these arguments. But the question is, will the treaty actually have the legal effect that's being proffered by the proponents of the treaty? We don't hear citations to articles of the treaty. We don't hear uh, consideration of the reports, the concluding observations by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability. We don't hear the kind of legal analysis that would be appropriate for analyzing the legal impact of this treaty. And I would submit it's the duty of this, this committee not to determine simply the policy issues and the emotional appeals, but to determine what the legal meaning of the treaty is and its legal application in the context both in international law and in domestic law of the United States. One of the ways that uh, the proponents misrepresent the nature of the treaty is on the definition of disability. We, proponents argue that the definition of disability is left blank in the treaty so that each nation can decide for itself what it believes is the correct definition. The Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability firm, firmly disagrees and is in the process of it, it, uh, issuing a general observation in response to that, but has already issued concluding observations to about nine countries, uh, Argentina, China, Hungary, Peru, Tunisia, Australia, and Austria. All were told that their nation's defi definition of disability was improper under the treaty's definition of disability. And what's improper about their definitions? They follow a medical definition of disability rather than a human rights definition of disability. And the difference in that definition is important because under a human rights definition of disability, according to the committee, a, a form of disability law that permits you to uh, take the situation of a profoundly dis uh, intellectually disabled adult Parents under the human rights model of disability would not be allowed to be appointed the guardian of the, of the adult intellectually disabled child, but instead could, would have to uh, be only allowed to be support decision making rather than substitute decision making. <clears throat> Uh, I cite the records from the CRPD committee that says this explicitly. Nations that allow guardianships 
for profoundly disabled adults that are intellectually disabled are in violation of the treaty's definition of what constitutes disability. That will be a profound change in American law, and if we think we will not have to comply with the treaty standards, then we're simply making a fake promise to the rest of the world. We are making a promise by our ratification that we, like all other nations, will obey the requirements of the treaty. Uh, turning to the issue of homeschooling, uh, I've been criticized by many in the press for uh, fear-mongering on this topic. But I've never seen any right of legal analysis. It's just simply conclusions, just assertions that I've incorrectly uh, analyzed the law on this. I have an LLM in public international law from the University of London. I have coached six, or excuse me, seven national championship moot court teams that debate constitutional law. I've written the legal analysis, and I dare anyone to read my legal analysis and answer it with legal analysis, not uh, conjecture and raw assertion. The legal analysis is based upon the failure of the CRPD to include the traditional right of parents to direct the upbringing and education of their children that was found in the ICCPR, in the ICESCR, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That, those provisions did protect the rights of parents. The, the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child began the trend in the wrong direction, and is followed by the CRPD. Article 24 of the treaty uh, supports, uh, defines the educational duties, and the word parent is not mentioned in the educational provision of Article 24 of this treaty. The best interest of the child standard has been applied uh, in international human rights contexts, including banning homeschooling in Germany. The highest court in Germany has held that homeschooling is banned under the best interest of the child standard. The European Court of Human Rights has upheld that ban, and when a German family fled to the United States, our administration appealed a successful grant of asylum to the Romica family that I represent now before the United States Supreme Court in a cert petition that's pending. And the, our Justice Department contends that Germany is within its rights Farris, to ban homeschooling. I have allowed you to go a minute and a half over time. I'm sorry, my clock isn't working. Oh, okay. Well, you're, you're at six, <coughs> almost seven, thank, eight minutes. Thank you, Senator. I'll, I'll, I'll pause. Okay, he he, uh, he was only yeah he was about seven minutes there, in that. Um, boy, that that was a lot of information. Here here's the point. I mean, you watch these videos. Matter of fact, if you want to know about treaties, go to the U.S. Senate website. Go to the Foreign Relations Committee and look up conventions on the right of persons with disability. Right now, it's right on the front page. It's th three hours uh, to watch. Uh, but you will find out about treaties and how they work and the give and take and the contrast. You are going to learn more in this three hours than you would, I, I don't know where else you can. This was textbook. This was give and take, back and forth, fantastic. And something that's brought up, this best interest of the child, and, and Michael Ferris was just getting to it, and that is communism. That is what it is, and Minnesota's been operating under that who decides the best interest of the child? Does the parent or does the state? In our state, it's the state. That means parents don't know uh, what the best interest of the child is. And when we give that over to the United Nations, because we don't define it real clear here, uh, the United Nations will be telling us what the best interest of the child is. That's best interest of the child came out of Nazi Germany. That's where it started, okay? And when we won the war with Nazi Germany and we killed all those uh, Nazis over in Germany. Guess how many died over here? None. They're still here. Okay, but they've gone into, oh, guess where? Planned Parenthood. Well, you go down to the woman's, whole woman's clinic down in Minneapolis, uh, right across the street from Hennepin County uh, Medical Center, 11 out of 13 women that go in there are black, are African Americans. They're targeting black people. And if you think that's okay, you got a problem, okay? But that's what they're doing, and the black community is silent about that. The African-American community is silent. It's terrible. But, hey, you know, it's not human. Well, what is it then? Come on, think about it. Okay, and I just want you to know I'm in some groups, uh, but this best interest of the child, this is breaking news, this is good news. 
even some of the most liberal groups here in Minnesota dealing with family law are thinking and believing that this best interest of the child definition needs to go away for the very reasons I've stated because the state decides and uh, there's fortunately a number of good people out there uh, trying to get this message across and I think we'll see some activity this legislative session. All right, we got more videos. Uh, uh, Nathan, uh, I'm going to have you go to uh, the second from the last, second to the top. We're going to do that one now. This is a conversation that went on with uh, Dick Durbin, Senator Durbin from Illinois. The wonderful things come out of Illinois, but I, it's just too good. So let's play that. If you got, you got it ready. And if, if I could, Mr. Ferris, if you would answer the question, uh, Senator. Um, I can't imagine a reservation that would be uh, legally uh, acceptable. That is, it's consistent with the object and purpose of the treaty that would satisfy the reservations that would be needed to comply with the, the three positive witnesses. You'd have to write the reservation to say, this treaty shall not bind the United States to comply with the standards of the treaty and shall have no domestic legal effect. If you would put that reservation in, that'd be fine. I'd support the treaty at that point in time because it's meaningless then. And what, what's being argued is that the treaty has no domestic meaning. And treaties, when we, when we accept a treaty, the only nation in the world that we're binding is us. We don't bind anybody else. Our ratification has no external legal effect anywhere. What, what's being argued is external political effect. And there's no record shown that our ratification of any other treaty has had external political effect that's been effective in seeking compliance with other human rights treaties. So it, it, it's, it's a shell game and empty promises that are being made. We need to determine whether or not we're going to comply with this treaty or not. And if we're not going to comply with the treaty, we ought not to ratify it because the number one thing this country should do with its treaty obligations is keep them in good faith. All right. Well, that was Senator Corker who asked a question, but uh, the the issue there, Michael Ferris saying, hey, uh, the only way really to deal with this treaty is to put in reservations, understandings, declarations that basically make the treaty void, you know, and of course that's no law at all. Um, anyway, okay, uh, look for, Nathan, look for... Uh, Convention CRPD Durbin. Uh, I guess I didn't know I had an extra video there. I didn't know I had ready. Uh, so let's, uh, if you got that, uh, let's go with that. I want to continue this there because we raised this issue as if, as if it stops us cold. We can't go forward on this disability convention until we work out this bond case. And I would say to Professor Meyer, Mr. Thornburg, I think there's a clear distinction here. The bond case is not being raised under the treaty, the convention, when it comes to chemical weapons. This case is being prosecuted under the Implementation Act, a separate act of Congress implementing the treaty. Two different things. So when we come to the Disability Act, what is the Implementation Act under the Convention for Disabilities? There is none. The only Implementation Act is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which has been on the books for 20 years. Have we tested that over 20 years? Has it eliminated homeschooling, Mr. Ferris? I don't think so. Has it mandated abortion across America, Dr. Yoshihara? No, it hasn't. The Americans with Disabilities Act is the implementing, implementing act that we've adopted ahead of the Treaty on Disabilities. The bond case is dealing with the Implementation Act on the Convention Weapons Treaties. Two separate actions by Congress. One, ratifying the Convention on Chemical Weapons. Two, passing a law called the Implementation Act, the law of the land. And now the Supreme Court will decide if that law is proper. So conflating these two and saying, oh, it's all about the same thing. One of our scholarly colleagues, the junior senator from Texas, said in a piece in the Washington Post, if the Supreme Court concludes that a treaty can be used to prosecute Americans, regardless of their constitutional rights, the ramifications could be alarming. Then he goes on with all sorts of opportunities. The prosecution is not under a treaty. 
The prosecution is under the Implementation Act. It's different. It's a law of Congress. And I'm, I'm just stopped cold here with this argument by Mr. Ferris that the Americans with Disabilities Act is going to put an end to homeschooling in America. Is that your position? Yes, sir. That's not my position. My position is that the treaty changes the, the legal requirements in this country, that it's just not correct to say that there is no duty to change American law in accordance with the treaty. So since I believe there will be required to be uh, an implementation act that complies with the requirements of the treaty, I think at that point in time, that's when the problems will arise. So Mr. Not Ferris, under the ADA itself. Mr. Ferris, the, ADA the, fa Mr. Ferris, the fact that the administration is not asking for an implementation act and made it clear that it's not seeking it because the Americans with Disability Act already is controlling and has been extensively litigated, sets disability standards in our country, which are higher than any in the world, you don't find that convincing. That's the same administration that's prosecuting a homeschooling family to try to ex uh, expel them from the United States, uh, who came here... Under the ADA? Asylum. Under the Americans with Disabilities no, Act? No, they came here uh, under our law of asylum. Yeah. But the, the question in the case that's pending, that case is also pending before the Supreme Court. Well, but th and that is for a certain... Let me just say, grant. Mr. Ferris, I don't know what... Well, I, I guess you pending. don't want me to answer the question after. Well, I don't think you can answer it because you want to talk about something other than the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Convention on Disabilities. And the that's what we're here to discuss. The Convention with Disabilities has a different legal standard than the ADA. I can there tell are, you... There are numerous disability organizations that say so. I include their, their citations in my written testimony. If we are going to I am not the only one that says that. The CRPD committee agrees with me. And I would just say to you, Mr. Ferris, that if we're going to have a battle of the organizations supporting and not supporting this, I think we're going to prevail because we have the mainstream disability organizations across America who are supporting the adoption of this Convention on Disabilities. And I, I just, it, it, I struggle with the notion that we are somehow going to stop this effort, this effort to extend the rights to the disabled around the world for fear of something which you can't even clearly articulate when it comes to homeschooling. As uh, Mr. Ridge says, I don't know whether to call him congressman or secretary, but we've been, we've been friends in both capacity. Uh, what he has said, he supports homeschooling, I do too. This is not going to affect homeschooling. It's very clear that it will not, and the Americans with Disabilities Act for 20 years has not affected homeschooling. I yield back my time. Well, this guy is the most disingenuous person that I know. Well, he's not probably the most, but I, I think it's, he's, he's up there. Definition, he, here's two things. Michael Ferris is making a couple mistakes. Well, he needs to make a presentation, and he's doing, it's a lawful, it's a legal presentation. And he's trying to engage the U.S. Senate in dealing with the law and having a conversation on the law and international law in treaties. The Senate is beyond that. They're right into the emotions. This is about emotions here. And of course, um, Mr. Ferris there is doing a little bit of that, but he laid the groundwork and from here on out, he's gotta go to the emotions. And even though he's speaking the truth, that this will take away parental rights. In California, they're already trying to do it. Now they have an ex the excuse was with the law there, um, uh, with the treaty if it's ratified. Uh, and that's what's stopping this whole thing. And of course, Senator Durbin going, uh, you know, making his statements about homeschooling. Uh, are you really saying that? And he's going, no, I never said that. I mean, this is Durbin setting up a straw man. Okay, and Michael Ferris is a cool hand, and you know, they, senators only have so much time to make their points and ask their questions. Uh, so that's why a lot of the cutting off is going on. It happens on both sides. But something interesting here is this bond case. And that came up where we're prosecuting people under a UN treaty that were never intended to be prosecuted, but it's happening. Okay, and the Supreme Court is having to deal with this. All right, we got a long video here. Probably won't get through it. May decide to skip forward on some of it. But this is uh, the chairman of the committee and Michael Ferris going at it. So let's hear what they have to say. Since um, uh, Mr. Ferris 
You describe the Disabilities Treaty as the ideal, quote unquote, wedge issue for future political campaigns. Is it because the treaty is such a good divisive political issue for you that you've made some of the claims about the treaty that, that you've made? Is it why you stated that the treaty proponents have sort of a Soviet agenda and your organization has made some, what many of us seeing pretty outrageous claims that the UN will determine how many parking spots are at American churches? Senator, the, um, the wedge issued comment was, I believe that uh, this treaty would be the first in, in the line of human rights treaties that would be coming before this treaty, before this committee. Uh, the committee, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, Senator McCain misspoke, I'm sure, uh, earlier. We have not ratified that treaty. And so I think that would be coming next. The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, that would be coming after that. I think that, that this, this treaty is the first of many treaties that would be in this, in this range. That's what the, was intended by that comment. On the parking space comment, um, I um, coach moot court, and you have hypothetical questions in moot court, and you tend to argue that way in a lot of venues. That's what I was doing there. When there's no definition of disability, and you give this organization the ability to, to define disability, anything is possible. I was trying to make an extreme case to show that anything is possible. I agree, I agree with you that you were trying to make an extreme case. And by the way, on the wedge issue, you weren't talking about a whole host of other potential treaties. You were talking about this treaty, the source is the story of Washington gridlock. Uh, in the Boston Globe by author Michael Cranish. And on the question of the parking lot reference, which you as yourself say is an extreme example, your organization or uh, an organization you're affiliated with, parentalrights.org, has a document detailing the 15 issues your organization has with the treaty. Reason number two, pretty much at the, stop, at the top, states that the number of handicapped spaces required for parking at your business, private school, or house of workership will be established by the UN, not your local government. That's, 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 and I'd like to uh, submit that article for the record uh, without objection. So, it, so, I, you know, that's, that's why, you know, I can understand uh, and respect your view, although I disagree with it, but when a statement like that is made, I think it undermines uh, the credibility of, of the, the nature of how far one could take this treaty. Let me ask you something else. In the disabilities, uh, Article 7, uh, parentheses 2 of the Disability Treaty, uh, it states that in all actions concerning children with disabilities, the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration. That seems like an incredibly non-controversial statement to me. So can you, I've read your testimony, and I've read the testimony last year as well. Can you tell me one example where the best interest of the child with disability should not be a primary consideration? Yes, because the, the, the term the best interest of the child standard is a legal term of art, and it means that the government gets to substitute its judgment for that of the parent. And so... You, you believe you, that is your interpretation. It is not the definitive. Well, it, that's the. I, I quoted Chef, uh, Professor Geraldine um, Van Buren, who is the leading expert on international rights of the child well, in the look, world. Let's look at what the convention says. The text says nothing about the state step, stepping into the shoes of the parents. In fact, Article 23 describes in detail protecting parental rights and the rights of the extended family to care for and to make decisions for children with disabilities. So I'm dumbfounded uh, how you can make a non-controversial statement and twist it into something that's rather sinister. Senator, the treaty, um, the ICCPR, protects directly the right of parents to direct the upbringing and education of their children. That language is missing in this treaty. If that language in the, was in this treaty, we would be in a different position. But that language is missing. That's the historical practice. The, the, uh, there's no direct statement about parents' rights in education in this treaty. And the best interest standard is a legal term of art that has been used by the German High Court to take parents' children away from them if they homeschool well, their children. Well, this is not the German High Court. But it's the this meaning is, of treaty. This is the United States of America, and the only High Court I care about is the Supreme Court of the United States. Let me ask you, finally, this. I, you, 
quoted Professor Henkin uh, as a buttress for your arguments, your, your legal arguments, and I appreciate that you have an LLM from London, which as I understand from a distance learning course. Uh, as a matter of, <laughs> there, there are no uh, comments permitted before the committee of uh, approvals or disapprovals. But as a matter of law, the courts have no authority to ignore reservations, understandings, and declarations. As a matter of fact, some of the most conservative lawyers, Professors Curtis Bradley and Jack Goldsmith, concluded that, quote, in sum, since the early days of the nation, the President and Senate have attached a variety of conditions to their consent to treaties. No court has ever invalidated these conditions. And, uh, and, and finally, when you quote Professor Henkin, you know, you seem to somehow suggest that he would not have supported ratifying this treaty. No, I think he would support ratification. I well, think I'm, that gl there, I'm glad we agree on that. that. A number of international, uh, internationalists would support it. They think it's good that we submit the United States to the supervision of the international community. I don't. But we, we at least agree on the, on the operation of international law. Uh, I don't disagree one whit with Professor Hankin on how he sees international law in operation. What we disagree about is this good yeah, or is this bad? Yeah, it's it's I brutal. Uh, go to the website, the U.S. Senate website. Watch this stuff. Um, remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, and that's other parents having the right to raise their children in the education and. Uh, beliefs for their choice who's going to stand up for your rights uh, remember good people don't do nothing God bless have a great week we'll see you next week you said to me that you wouldn't leave but now I see that you're lost. Sets on fire.